Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Mamadou. Uh, we'll just give it a couple more minutes. I see uh, we have still folks logging on. So give it maybe 30 seconds to a minute and we'll get started here. Thank you. All right, I see we still have folks joining us, but we'll go ahead and get started. Again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good evening uh, and good afternoon, wherever you may be. So my name is Mamo Duba, and I'll be today's presenter. Um, I've been with Onset for about 10 years, uh, majority of it as far as a member of the hardware design team. Uh, my current, as in my current role, I'm the senior product manager leading the product management team here at Onset. And my primary focus is on uh, the connected product line. So that refers to the, our stations, uh, wireless sensors and smart sensors that are compatible with our RX station and uh, uh, predominantly serving the agriculture and environmental research applications. Also on the call is Mike. Mike, you want to say hello? Hi, folks. Uh Mike Delellis here. Uh, I'm the technical support manager for the Hobo Group. I've been with Onset now for just over 18 years and 16 of those have actually been with the support group. Um, I joined in uh, 2000, and I joined the support group in 2007, uh, two years prior in a uh, the production repair group. Um, but I've been assisting uh, customers ever since. And uh, today I'll be um, helping Mama do uh, answer questions. So I'll be monitoring the uh, questions box. So uh, you guys will see that on your right. So please feel free to ask away. Great. Thanks, Mike. So getting started here, just a couple of webinar logistics. So this webinar will probably last about 45 minutes. Um, estimating we'll need no more than 30 minutes to go through the material we've prepared, uh, giving us 15 minutes or so to answer questions. So please fire away. Uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation and Mike will be monitoring and will answer as many questions as we can. Again, please uh, again enter your questions and as always the webinar will be recorded and will be made available. So before again I get started here, just who we are, I think most folks here are familiar with Onset. Uh, we are the home of the data logger. We truly pride ourselves in making reliable and accurate um, data logging devices. Um, as we say, the proof is in the data, so we are truly focused on delivering the power of data today to help you build a better tomorrow. So we've been doing this for over four decades. So today's agenda, before I jump into the best practices and uh, some of the consideration um, that I want to share, I just want to take a step back, quickly do a, a product overview of Hobonet, what it is for folks that may not be very familiar with Hobonet, then really jump into now the, uh, the I'd say uh, the, the main topic, right, around deployment consideration, and just provide some tips on mounting and positioning uh, your wireless sensors, uh, some tips on maximizing battery performance, and then transition to Hobolink, our cloud software, which is really the tool that you'll be using uh, most of the time. You know, once the deployment is uh, completed, you'll probably be relying more on link to know what's uh, how, how your system is doing and performing and then we'll wrap it and then we'll wrap it up so quick overview uh, on Hobonet uh, it is a wireless mesh network um, system and I'll touch a little bit more about what we mean by wireless mesh network um, it uh, the, the nodes themselves 
they're both data loggers. Uh, they do store the data uh, locally until it is pushed to the cloud. And they also act as transceivers. So they, they have a line of sight of up to 2000 feet, um, depending on how, how you have your sensor located, right? Uh, and I'll also expand a little bit more on the line of sight, what is meant by line of sight. They are again, compatible with our RX station. And also they've been designed with ease of deployment in mind. So they all they require is a push of a button to get them self-configured and to be part of your system. And they've been made easy to mount to pull and post. And we have two offering and the main one that's typically used are the ones with rechargeable battery with a built-in solar panel. Expanding a little bit on the mesh network. So I would say, you know, three main components here around reliability, range and scalability. On the reliability piece, uh, it is a sub gigahertz network, which can easily reach several hundred meters, uh, both indoor and outdoor. Actually outdoor can even go a couple of kilometers. Uh, and expanding a bit on the range, the range of sub gigahertz network is longer uh, than Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, compare if you compare it using the same antennas. And again, this is because the lower radio frequencies in sub gigahertz networking is not absorbed by physical matter as much as, for instance, uh, 2.4 gigahertz signals would be. Uh, and another reason for the longer range is that it typically runs at lower speed uh, and lower power as well. Uh, as far as the range, you know, you can automatically uh, extend the range of your net mesh network. Uh, and with mesh network, the network can be extended simply by adding uh, more nodes to the network. Again, and this is kind of the visual representation of that. Uh, so uh, earlier I mentioned that uh, the nodes themselves, they are transceivers, so they can uh, receive and transmit the information. And our system allow for that data to hop up to five times to get back to the main station. Uh, and our system uh, supports up to 50 sensors uh, per station. So, all right, so that's just a quick, uh, that was a quick high level overview of just focusing again, just on the wireless uh, sensor portion of it, not necessarily uh, extending into uh, the sensor offering or the station offering. So I'll keep it focused on the sensor, on the wireless uh, sensor network piece but please, any question you may have, please uh, on, let us know. So some deployment consideration, I would say one of the most important things is really familiarity with the terrain. And why I say that is um, depending on, because no two deployment is the same. And for example, using this picture as an example, you know, if you if you, all you care about is maybe, for instance, to monitor soil moisture on this side of the hill, and maybe temperature on the other side of this hill, for instance, um, again, you have that hill in the middle, and then that will absorb the signal. So you wouldn't be able to transmit through that. And what that would require, for instance, some of the question you may ask yourself is like, do I need an extender, right? Even though the uh, the wireless sensors themselves, they act as transceivers. But if, for instance, at the top of this hill, you don't require monitoring any parameters, we actually do offer extenders that you can use to allow you, to, again, to extend that range through the hopping mechanism. Uh, so again, I would say uh, uh, why familiarity with the terrain is to figure out, do I need uh, extenders? Uh, another question that may help you answer is how many systems do you need? Uh, because again, it's due to the range of one uh, station and, uh, and wireless sensor system, there's some limitation, quote unquote, right? Uh, depending again on the terrain, do you have hills? Uh, what's the line of sight? I would say generally, rule of thumb, I would say if, you're, if the spatial area you're trying to cover is more than seven acres, I would say you may want to consider having two separate stations. Uh, granted, we've seen evidence of a lot of our users uh, being able to use one system 
and being able to cover uh, beyond seven acres. But again, no, no two deployment are exactly the same. So it just would depend on the reality of your terrain. Uh, transitioning to setting up the system. So one uh, recommendation we 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 will we provide is um, as you're building your system, it is very important that you do that near the, the near your station. For instance, if you already had a station deployed and you're looking to add Hobonet um, to that system, it is very important to make sure that as you are setting up that system. You, you do that near the station. And I'll uh, step through that and give some examples. And if you haven't deployed your station, then you may even want to do it at home or in your lab or wherever you may be located. So you don't have, you know, you can do it just in the comfort of your own home, as we like to say. So I'll step real quick through the what it takes to set up Hobonet. Um, so they're typically two, we, they're compatible with two of our products. They're compatible with the RX, uh, family of products, the RX3000 and the RX2106. So for the RX2106, the Hobonet, uh, I'll call it the, the motherboard, the root manager, is comes pre-configured. So it comes already assembled, you don't need to do anything, you're ready to go. But if you already have been an RX3000 user and you have your own system uh, using our smart sensors and you're looking to expand and use Hobonet, all you would need is to purchase from us uh, this uh, manager and just using one of these slots, just add it to your system. So few few tips as you, you know, especially if you're looking to add it to a system, it is very important to make sure you stop your station, you connect to Hobolink just to make sure that all the data you already had in your system uh, has been stored, uh, then you power down, um, add the manager to your system and then power back up. So this is this is only applicable uh, for the RX3000. Again, the RX2106, uh, that root manager comes already assembled. Once you powered it up, again, repeating here, but it is very important that you establish the wireless network uh, near the station. Uh, once you do that, all you have to do is um, just uh, deploy uh, those sensors where you need them without needing to do anything. And again, getting them to the system is pretty easy. Uh, you just set up your station uh, to search mode. So essentially, you just need to uh, push this button, uh, I think two or three times, uh, uh, set it up on search mode. So essentially, at that point, it's almost like when you're trying to pair uh, your Bluetooth device to your car or at home. Uh, you essentially putting it in pairing mode. And at that point, let's say even if you have 50 sensors, all you need to do is uh, either, if they already don't have batteries, insert the batteries or just push the button and hold for three seconds. And they'll also start broadcasting and uh, uh, look to join the system. And it's and much simpler and easier when they're all near each other. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Hey, Mamadou, I just wanted to just add something for everybody here. Um, uh, so when setting up the uh, RxW systems, whether it be with a 2100 or an RX3000, um, it's always good to have a couple a uh, couple folks with you. Um, and uh, so, you know, one person could uh, be, or um, uh, you could both start at the station, and then one person can sort of walk out to where the um, the moat is going to be uh, deployed for a while. Um, so that uh, yeah, just a, just a just a good deployment tip. I've done a bunch of these, and I always always easier to do uh, with multiple people. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that's a great point. I'll also add to that. I'll also recommend uh, before you set up your system in its final configuration, uh, it's also good just to set it up at the fastest logging interval and calling or connection rate, right? So as let's say one of your colleagues is moving around and trying to find the best location, you can actually look at your system and the result to see the data come through and get a sense of if they're connected or not. Mama, do uh, mind if I just answer a couple of que uh, questions audibly here? Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, so, um, so Carol asks, um, is it necessary to have a station, or will the single sensor collect its own data? Um, so, you uh, you do have to have a station uh, in order for the RxW system to work. So, it's sort of a it's sort of a, a system thing where everything works together. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The, the station essentially acts like a gateway. Uh, that's what pushed the data to the cloud. That's, that's correct. 
Uh, and then well, we have a question here about, um, uh, you know, actually a few questions on this, uh, whether or not the presentation will be available after this. And yes, of course it will. Uh, we'll make that we'll make that available to anybody who registered. All right, thanks. A um, uh, couple of other things to consider um, uh, around the station location. So generally, um, if you only using the station with wired sensors, um, I would say there's a little bit more flexibility about where you want to uh, put that station. But I'll say once you add a wireless system to it, it is very uh, critical to make sure that uh, you have your station. I would, I would call it at the highest point where it gives all your sensors that are deployed around the system um, a, a good opportunity to join the system. And I'll just use this as an example. Um, kind of, this is like the profile view of that picture I was just showing. So let's say, so this is actually one of the, the beta, beta sites we use. Uh, it's a winery that's based in, uh, in Portugal. Um, even though the owners, they live here, right? Uh, had they had just a wire, just the weather station with wired sensors, it would make sense to just keep it near home so you can have easy access to it. But the moment a wireless sensor was added to it, and you essentially have this hill and you have this flat area where they needed to monitor, the weather station was placed at the top. So what it did, it gave line of sight to the sensors that are on the higher ground, and as well, you were able to extend and get um pretty much a range uh, for the sensors that were down downhill so uh, had the station been placed here you would probably have good connection and reliable transmission uh, for the sensors uh, that are down the hill but the sensors that are on the other side would have struggled to, to connect so those are just the you know few things to to think about as you are um, positioning your station and for instance, as you'll see, they have a temperature, soil moisture, solar radiation. Uh, this, this device here is actually a, a repeater. So because of the terrain and how steep it is, they actually needed to add a couple of repeaters just to make sure that they provided alternate paths uh, for the data to be able to get back to the station. So those are a few considerations. So uh, it's very critical where you position the uh, the the nodes themselves, but as well very critical where you position the the station. All right, so now I'll transition to the nodes themselves, the sensors, uh, on just uh, providing few tips on mounting and positioning. So I think about November we actually start shipping our products with a mounting bracket. Uh, that we recommend that you use uh, uh, to 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 make sure that you just have the best performance. Well, this is a video that was working, but that decided not to work. But anyway, we're just showing uh, how the installation is. So essentially, it is a bracket that you mount on the pole. You can either use tie wrap, or you can actually uh, screw them on a post. Um, and I think this may actually be a better view here. So this slot allows you to mount um, the, the sensor uh, on a pole. And uh, these two holes here also allow you to uh, bolt it. And what it does is it ensures that you actually don't put pressure on the sensor housing itself. Uh, uh and not distort the housing because we've seen few evidence of you know over tightening uh of the sensors and what it ends up doing it it just create potential paths for water to get through uh we've also what we've done so essentially once you attach the the node to to this bracket uh there are no pressure or no there are no pressure point around uh, the 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 sensor itself the moat itself and by that it makes sure that it's it's sealed uh, for for um, uh, moisture ingress and we've also added a gore vent uh, to the housing itself and that also helps with moisture egress just ensuring that uh, any moisture that may be built up 
uh, depending on where the sensor is deployed, that moisture has a chance to, to, to get out. So I would say, you know, tip one, make sure you use those mounting bracket. Uh, the second tip would be just generally to, uh, to avoid um, uh, mounting uh, the transceivers themselves on metal poles. Um, now they do work, you know, when you, once you mount them on metal poles, uh, they even work inside buildings. So they, uh, building monitoring is actually uh, an application where they use uh, a lot by of our, a lot of our users. But it is just all about range, right? If you're only uh, looking to transmit a few hundred meters, up to 500 meters, not a problem. But if you're looking to maybe, you know, uh, take the system to its limit, quote unquote, and you're looking to, uh, to, uh, to, to transmit data from one sensor to another, you know, up to a couple of kilometers, then it becomes very important to make sure that you don't have anything, any, any physical matter that can absorb uh, the transmission. So that will really limit uh, the range. Uh, so for example, here is an example. Uh, it's a courtesy of uh, one of our, uh, I guess I'll call him a corporate alumni, Scott. Uh, this was a, a deployment that he had done. Uh, another one that I like that also one of my colleagues shared recently uh, Caesar is actually, as you'll notice on this poll, um, he made sure that the antenna was actually above the pole. And what it does, we've designed the antenna in such a way that horizontally we maximize the transmission range uh, horizontally. So, and it is um, both going, I'll call it left to right and front and back. Uh, we we get a uh, decent range from all directions. That's why, and so the moment he actually moved the antenna above the pole, he's just maximized the range on both sides, right? So this actually would be uh, a good technique, especially if you strategically uh, placing a sensor or a repeater at a, at a location to maximize range. And to expand a little bit on line of sight, so, Line of sight is a term that I frankly, that even confuses me because it uh, almost sounds like, you know, so long I can see the sensor, uh, I am fine, which is quote unquote true. But when, when uh, we talk about uh, line of sight, what is at the technical level, what it truly means, it kind of refers to this, what they refer to as the Fresnel zone. So essentially um, the antenna, when they transmit, it's almost like a football shape. You know, I should say American football, if you look at the football shape. And what it does is as it transmits, actually, you know, some of them reflects uh, that some of that signal gets absorbed by the ground, which can actually reduce the transmission range. I guess a long way of saying that to maximize transmission, you want your antenna or your receiver to be as high as possible, right? So for instance, uh, I don't have data on this, on this uh, deployment or how far this sensor was communicating, but I'm willing to bet that at a minimum it was uh, communicating a couple of kilometers. Uh, so the transmission, for example, the transmission range we use as a spec uh, is based on the fact that the sensor is mounted at 1.8 meters. So that 1500 feet or a little bit less than 500 meters transmission, transmission range that's when the sensor is mounted at 1.8 meter. And if it's mounted at three meter, then that transmission range is 2000 feet or 600 meters. So essentially the higher the sensor, essentially it's you are, this zone, you are pretty much shifting it up. And the more you shift it away from the ground, the, 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 the longer you'll, you will, that transmission range will be. Obviously there are limitations to that depending on you know, what you're monitoring and where you need that sensor to be placed. So there will be constraints on where you can place it. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Sure, I just wanted to interrupt and I apologize uh, just for a few That's more okay. questions. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a, a few questions here uh, related to sort of inside or indoor industrial applications. Uh, just mm -hmm. to let you all know, there, there are a series of these um, that um, that can be used inside. They, they, they actually don't have uh, solar panels. Uh, same thing with the RX2100 series as well. Um, they just use um, sort of standard uh, AA batteries, if you will. So uh, yes, um, 
So definitely uh, consider these for those applications as well. Um, also related uh, in uh, one of those questions was about the height in such an application uh, and whether or not going through walls would have uh, an impact on the, the range. Uh, so the answer is, uh, so in terms of walls and, and things like that, yes, there is an impact uh, on the range that these uh, can achieve there. Um, so anything uh, high density like concrete or steel, uh, you know, certainly most R, you know, RF devices uh, do get uh, impeded by that. Um, so same with these. Um, uh, wood studded walls are typically not too much of an issue, um, although if there's a whole bunch of stuff around them, of course, there can be uh, some issues there. But um, so uh, in those instances, yeah, the higher, uh, the better. And the same sort of goes with uh, the uh, you know outside applications as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great point. Because and something we've done, we've seen some applications where actually uh, like in farming, I'll call it like end to end farming from the farm to, you know, uh, monitoring uh, uh, temperature on dairy for all of that. We actually have folks that use this system uh, and even uh, monitoring uh, the internal environment of their freezers. So obviously uh, the range will be uh, will be attenuated quite a bit. But again, going back to the need, potential need or not of repeaters, a lot of users, what they do, let's say if they're measuring um, uh, uh, temperature within a freezer, they'll just put one of these repeaters on the on outside that freezer. So that provide an easy way to get pretty much that signal out and relay it back out. Uh, so so you have folks again, they use it in a farm. Uh, if they're uh, doing dairy or milk manufacturing, also using the same system uh, to actually be able to, to monitor both. All right. Um, before I transition, any other questions related to this, Mike? Um, there, there is a whole bunch on that I'm catching up on. So uh, just uh, okay. continue on. I'll, I'll interrupt okay. you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right. No, no. Feel, feel. Thing. I'll just cover here. You know, I'll maybe take next five, five minutes. Mike, just wrap up here, and then we can take on those questions. Sure. So, a couple more tips on maximizing uh, battery performance. Um, generally, if you're using, again, one of our outdoor system where you're using the rechargeable batteries. Um, so long that you know the moats or nodes are uh, um, they they require I guess I guess they require um, so long you you know they receive optimal sunlight I guess that's one way the best way to put it uh, I would say battery life is a non-issue right uh, as Mike just mentioned especially for indoor application or if you deploying your system uh in regions where it is uh cold we actually do provide lithium non-rechargeable batteries that you can use so using those batteries so long uh you're not logging any any you, if you're not if your logging interval isn't faster than a minute they'll last you a year right and uh and in instance where you're using rechargeable batteries so long they receive optimal sunlight um then you should be okay then batteries shouldn't be an issue um, I would just say you may need to adjust periodically uh, the path as the path of sunlight changes right throughout the year or trees or leaf grow and altering the amount of sunlight uh, that that uh, solar panel may see. Um, and also, you know, all the batteries will eventually lose their charge capacity and may need to be replaced. Uh, but uh, for the rechargeable batteries, they'll last you a minimum of three to five years. But one thing that I wanted to touch on again is the topology of how you have your system uh, set up. So above, uh, going back here, you know, this is probably your typical topology when it comes to wireless networking, where you have multiple paths and option. Um, certainly, you know, to maximize range, uh, generally uh, there's a tendency to want to maximize range from one sensor to, to another so you can maximize the spatial coverage. That said, if I use this, uh, this topology as an example, uh, these two sensors at the, at, at the edges, they'll pretty much just act as, uh, these will act as transmitters. Uh, this I meant to say receiver, right? These will act as transmitters. This one will act as receiver. 
these three in the middle will kind of act as transceivers. But more importantly, I want, just wanted to point out uh, an example of where your topology is uh, such as you maybe have the majority of your system relaying data through one node. Uh, there are a couple of concerns with that generally. One of them is that battery life will be reduced because the, uh, the device does consume power when it's transmitting and receiving data. So essentially, if this one you know, uses 1x, this one at a minimum would use 4x, right? Because it's receiving data from three devices and also relaying that data. So roughly, you know, the charge capacity uh, of this device will be, uh, of these device will be 4x that of this one. So long way of saying that the battery life will be drastically reduced for this device. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind as well is, you know, it's always good to avoid uh, having the majority of your sensors communicating through one, uh, because you're essentially creating a single point of failure, right? Uh, the system will only be as strong as its weakest link. So in a situation where maybe you've maximized range from sensor to sensor, and there aren't alternate path to get back to the, to the, to the station, if you have any type of issue with this sensor, let's say the battery uh, batteries gets weak because it's transmitting uh, and receiving data more frequently than the rest of your system, then, then it may fail. And that would uh, unfortunately take down your system. So there's always that balance again between maximizing range, maximizing the system, but also keeping in mind that the true power of uh, the wireless mesh network is it's in the is in capacity just to figure out what are the best paths uh, to get the data back uh, to the station. So quickly here, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things on Hobolink, uh, and then we'll go to questions, Mike. Uh, Hobolink again. I thought I touched on Hobolink a bit because uh, again, as I said at the beginning, once you have your system deployed, you know, for the rest of the for the rest of the life of the product generally you rely on, on, on the software, right, to get access to your data. So I just wanted to share a couple features that Hobolink provide that you may or may not be aware of or, or not use as frequently. So generally uh, around just checking the node power, um, there are two ways you can check the remaining battery power, right? Uh, when you're on Hobolink, if you click on the station, uh, do we have an overview page? Uh, this right column, essentially, for every sensor that we have, even if you have 50 sensors in your system, for each sensor, it will give you the battery level. We also do have the option, if you're using the map view as well, if you have concern about a specific uh, sensor, uh, you can actually click on it and it will, it will give you the battery level. Another thing around, again, uh, leveraging the software just to get a sense of how your system is doing. You can also monitor the connectivity. Uh, again, similar to the battery level, right next to the battery level, you can see your connectivity uh, performance. Uh, and again, likewise, on the map feature under the connectivity as well, it will let you know uh, how well your system is doing. As far as the color coding, I figure I touched on it a little bit. Um, as you, you know, it may not provide the right level of context on the software. So the green, you know, would generally give you uh, five bars. And what that means is that node is regularly connecting to the network successfully and is within range of neighboring mode. The orange with two to four bars generally indicate that the sensor does not always connect successfully. Uh, so essentially, you know, it, it Ultimately, it does, it, but it just may take a couple of tries. Uh, but it does uh, 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 connect. But uh, when when your one of your sensors is generally in this orange state, uh, you may want to just consider checking on the mode and adjusting its position or the location of one of the other neighboring modes if necessary. Uh, when it's red, one bar, it indicates that actually that this node is not connecting to the uh, to the network regular regularly, and there we would strongly encourage you to re reposition uh, uh, that sensor for a reliable communication. And no bars just means that uh, um, white with no bar indicates that the mode is offline and is not connecting uh, to the network at all. 
um, and it would be good. So that one, um, if it's a, well, if it's a new newly added mode and you're waiting for the first sensor reading, no no action is required, right? It's just taking time to join the system. But if you expect it to connect, you may want to check it for for um, for issues for errors. Um, and uh, you know when what happens when a node goes offline generally uh, what I'll recommend again is to use the map feature uh, so the map feature gives you a sense uh, because you actually the map view uh, provides you data on the the transmission path right so if 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 one of your mode goes offline often uh, yeah, I would, you know, even before going into the field, it is good to uh, take a look at the map to get a sense of, you know, where it's located, if there may be a reason, or if you, or just quickly give you a sense, maybe it may be faulty so that before you head out, you can actually maybe take a replacement component, but it can quickly give you a sense of, you know, is it maybe due to its location, or maybe, you know, are most the majority of the sensors um, uh, uh, transmitting data through that one mode, right? So that can uh, give you a sense of maybe I need to reposition it so that I'm not using as much of the battery uh, as compared to other devices. Uh, one feature I actually wanted to mention is every now and then you may uh, connect to your device and it will be in recovery mode. And what that means is that device wasn't able to connect, but that data has been logged and stored on the sensor. And once the next time it gets connected to the system, it will push that data to the station. So when a node is in recovery mode and it has some critical information uh, that, uh, that, that you require, um, I would, what, the, what I recommend is actually to get physical access to that sensor and either relocate it or get it closer to the station until it's connected to the station so that you can get that data back before you uh, restart your system, because you may lose that data if you restart the station. So again, uh, repositioning it first or bringing it closer to the station until you have a solid connection and that data is transmitted, then you may want to uh, take all, all the action or steps. But uh, I would say fight the urge of uh, uh, restarting your station until that data uh, has been recovered. I think I do have some other slides, but for this to make sure I uh, I meet my commitment to covering uh, questions, I'll just maybe just touch on this. So just quickly for folks that may not be aware of all the options we provide, again with the uh, Hoban wireless sensors, we have all your weather uh, weather data parameters, temperature, relative humidity, rainfall, wind speed, direction. Uh, and then in the ag for ag application, leaf wetness, solar radiation, and others. And we also do have a pretty extensive uh, soil moisture offering uh, for our uh, customers that are in environmental research or making irrigation decision in agriculture and the likes. With that, I'll stop there, Mike, and see how many questions we can get through. Great. Well, uh, we certainly do have a lot. Actually, many of these questions, Mamadou, are based on range. Um, so uh, a few questions about uh, urban areas, uh, forests, uh, inclement weather, including wind, things like that, uh, and then sort of positioning around, um, uh, you know, uh, basically the orientation of a particular RxW sensor. Um, so uh, I think I can sort of maybe hit a whole bunch of birds with one stone here. Um, Sure. So in terms of, um, you know, urban areas, yes, right? So you can definitely use these in urban areas. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the structures that exist in those types of areas, uh, you know, of course, will limit the range on these. You won't be able to get those, uh, those massive ranges like you can uh, in, a, in an open field environment. Um, but for sure, um, you know, with use, when you're using the outdoor products, you want to just make sure you have, uh, you know, some sunlight during the day so that you can get a good charge. Um, and provided that you have that, these really can be used anywhere. Um, same goes with forest applications. Uh, so here you have a lot of uh, you know dense uh, and you know high moisture vegetation. Um, that's another um, you know sort of hindrance for RF signals is that high moisture. So uh, you know anything live wood will reduce those um, uh, that signal down a little bit, right? So uh, you just won't be able to get those max ranges. 
uh, but still applicable. And uh, you know, these sensors, uh, what they do is they actually hop up to five times, right? So that means one sensor connects to another sensor and they form this mesh, mesh network so that you can really uh, you know, uh, leverage uh, those devices together and you know, make this mesh network and extend your range as, as far as you possibly can. Um, as far as inclement weather and you know wind and things like that, you know, do does that affect the range? Uh, inclement weather can. So if it's raining, um, you know, it's the same sort of principle as when your satellite TV goes down when it starts raining. Um, uh, you know that that can have an effect. Um, as long as you're not at the very far or extremes of the range, um, you'll most likely be fine. Um, so um, you know, certainly I wouldn't. You know, if you have a lot of rain in your area, I wouldn't hesitate to deploy these, um, you know, just consider maybe you don't want to go the full, uh, you know, 2,000 feet uh, per, you know, per, per sensor there. So um, then uh, one question about external antennas. Uh, unfortunately, no, these you want to use these devices as they come. Uh, there is no option for uh, external uh, antennas. Um, yeah, and, and maybe a comment on that. We actually, you know, for that, for that part of the design, we actually, uh, Worked with a with a external, um, I'll call it organization, where all they do is antennas, and the antenna was custom made and tailored to, to maximize range. Again, so it, again, you know, uh, there's just limitation of wireless in general, right? Like with any wireless product, but but the, these antennas have been max. It's really been tailored and custom made to maximize range. Uh, so, Mamadou, we also had a few questions. Um, around compatibility with MX products. And um, so this is, a, this is a different system. So unfortunately, there's no compatibility with those uh, MX products. Um, a couple of folks were asking about the MX 2001s. And um, yeah, those are, those are basically separate systems. Hmm. Um, another user asked about, um, you know, are these Wi-Fi based? Uh, no, so this is a 900 megahertz uh, system. Uh, that's the, the the signal that we use for the mesh network and for communicating from the actual devices, the modes, the RXWs, to the station. The stations themselves, they're uh, they're all uh, GSM based or cellular based. Um, so um, I'll see. And then we also had one question about uh, getting this data off to uh, from Hobolink uh, off to a website. Um, so there's a couple different ways of doing that. Uh, our Hobolink service uh, is really robust. Um, we offer an API. Uh, that's probably the most popular to do what you want to do there. Um, and so you can programmatically access the data uh, and then you know and do with it uh, what you want there and bring it up to a website. Um, we also have a data delivery option. So you can send a file out uh, via FTP or even email. Um, and then of course we also have um, uh, right now there's a there's a dashboard in there that you can use uh, and you can actually you know uh, use that um, to even um, uh, populate a, a website if you wanted to. So yeah, and maybe I'll just explain a little bit on the previous point around you know kind of the communication protocol of the sensors. So again, those those were we developed that took us years to come up with it. So I guess long way of saying you know you don't pay for that communication. Uh, it is not Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. It it it, it uh, frankly just works, right? I think again, communications comes in play when it comes at the station, but how you push that data to the cloud, uh, and what really makes it attractive is especially you know when it comes from a cost standpoint, you're only paying for getting that data to the cloud and all the sensors themselves, uh, you know talk and communicate access transceivers and it's not uh, anything you have to do there. Um, and I just wanted to expand on some, make a comment. I know we've been focused on, you know, range, uh, which, you know, comes in play quite a bit outdoor, but I just want to clarify that, you know, these products, they uh, designed to work from both indoor and outdoor application. So they work indoor and indoor application, you know, you're not looking to communicate for kilometers or anything like that, right? If we're talking, you know, a couple hundred meters or 500 feet, it, it works. Uh, great. Uh, Mama, do we have a time for just a few more here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I just want to be respectful of people's time, but I, you know, we'll, let's go another five minutes or so. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just a, a few um, questions here on, so how to contact, uh, who to contact uh, if you need help 
um, with one of these stations. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm uh, so my name is Mike, and I'm the tech support manager. And um, we are more than happy in the tech support team to help you out if you're having trouble with these stations. So, uh, so please visit our website. Uh, so it's onsetcomp.com. You'll see down the bottom there's a contact us form, and then right there, uh, if you scroll in that page, you'll see the uh, contact technical support. Um, so if you fill out all the information there, we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, and uh, you know, we're always uh, more than happy to, to help there. Um, uh, we have a user here uh, asking for a little bit more detail on uh, some of the inside setups. Um, and uh, so uh, maybe I sort of elaborate uh, a little bit on that. So we do have that series on uh, that series of devices that uh, it's a, so it's a non-solar powered device. Uh, they uh, they run, off, run off the batteries and every year or so you have to change them out. Um, and, uh, and they work very similar, in fact, exactly the same as the, uh, the outdoor units. Um, and uh, the, setup, the setup is virtually identical. Uh, it's just you don't have to worry about really facing the sun. Um, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. If you're interested in one of those, uh, please contact our sales folks. They'll be more than happy to tell you all about um, you know, what, the, what type of products that'll, that you'll need for your application. Um, one other question here I wanted to touch base on. There was a, a, a question on what do we have uh, for MX products? And I know this doesn't relate to this, but uh, for MX products to get that data into the cloud. Uh, we do offer a gateway for the MX products, and um, it's um, uh, you can you can use that. It will basically connect. Uh, it will take the Bluetooth advertisements, which contains all of the data uh, from those devices, uh, and it will send it right up to the Hobolink cloud. Uh, and from there, you'll have access to it. Uh, so definitely check it, check that out on our on our website. You can just search MX Gateway. You'll get right to it. Yeah, and we can also you know as far far of the when we send out uh, the the recording, we'll also make sure we include some some information on that. Another question about another question about uh, um, indoor systems and walls. Um, yeah, so it's really it's a it's a tough um, thing to know unless once until you get there, uh, you know how much impedance that you're going to get. Uh, from the particular, you know, the installation you're, you're working with, whatever wall is there. Um, a word of advice, if you're, if you're doing one of these installations, uh, and by the way, this sort of goes outside too with the for heavily forested applications. Uh, it's always better to have an extra repeater, right? Uh, or an extra repeater or two uh, in that instance, right? So if you're, if you're in a place where the signal is low due to whether it be a wall or thick, uh, dense vegetation, uh, putting an extra repeat, repeater in the sort of in the middle of those two parts there always helps. Uh, question about how to access that API I mentioned. Um, contact us um, same way. Contact the technical support department. We can help you out with that. And I'm just trying to catch up on a few other things, folks, or, or a few other questions here. Uh, is it possible to connect an external sensor into the system? Yes, with the RX3000 system, you can use a um, the RXW module, uh, so that'll get you the RXW system. Uh, but also, there's a, an additional module that you can plug into the um, the logger itself, right? So uh, we don't have uh, an analog uh, module or not an analog RXW just yet, uh, yeah, but uh, we do have one for the um, uh, for the station itself. Yep. Um, I assume you have a product uh, for measuring water level uh, with a solar panel. Uh, so yes, we do. Uh, not uh, so uh, with a solar panel, and we'll upload to the cloud. Yes, we do. That's the RX uh, twenty one hundred series. Um, I don't have the particular model of that. So twenty one hundred four. Twenty one hundred four. Okay, thank you, Mamadou. Yep. Um, uh, that system uh, is uh, does not have the RxW um, uh, wireless system built into it. Uh, with the 2100 series, it's sort of one of the other. One or the other. You have the, the water level or the RxW system. Um, and I think. I'm just scrolling through here, folks. Uh, I know there's probably a whole bunch, but there's a lot of questions here. Um, 
see if I find anything else that will help us. Uh, do you have hobo net sensors that can be used underwater? Um, uh, so many of the temperature probes can be put underwater. We've actually done that uh, in a lot of local installations here. We're in, uh, in Cape Cod uh, in Massachusetts. Um, so yes, uh, so underwater temperature we can definitely do. Um, just a uh, caveat, you don't want to put the RxW underwater. <laughs> just, just the probe. Um, I think I generally hit most of these, Mama. Do I don't know if there's okay. anything else you wanted to bring up here? Yeah, no, no. I just wanted to to uh, thank everyone for joining. Um, I would say, you know, um, you know, Hobonet definitely one of our flagship product. Uh, we have a lot of items on our product roadmap that will be uh, working to extend uh, this product offering. Uh, so, you know, uh, some of the questions around getting a, a third party sensors you can use with Hobonet, that's uh, uh, high uh, on the list of things we'll be making uh, available in the very near future. So again, thank you so much everyone for joining. We, we appreciate everything you do in supporting us make this world a, a better world so so thank you everyone and we'll follow up with the recording and also any questions we're unable to 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 touch on we'll make sure you follow up with you thank you everyone thanks mike thank you take care folks